Hey guys, Brian from Brian Bowes here. Today I'm going to answer some more of your questions. I get a lot of questions from you guys in comments as well as in messages. And I, whenever possible I try to answer them as completely as I can uh, right there in the, in the comment section. Sometimes I just don't have the time or space to answer fully. So today I'm going to expand on some of the more relevant questions. I think there's a good possibility that some of these questions might come up for you at some point in the future. So hopefully if you watch this video, you should get a little bit of useful information that might come in handy someday as far as your BOAS. And of course, I always appreciate these questions, so please keep the questions coming, and I'll continue to do videos of this type. So I'm just gonna look at my question list here. And so the, the first question is rather interesting and rather specific, uh, and it goes, how much iodine and selenium should I give a four-foot snake? And what other things should I supplement? So to answer your first question, none. I wouldn't give any kind of supplement of this nature uh, to a reptile, provided you're feeding it a balanced diet, which you know for boas, of course, is a whole animal, either a, a rodent or a, you know some kind of bird or you know a prey item that was raised on a complete healthy diet. As long as the prey items you feed your boas and other snakes are raised on a complete diet, you don't need to worry about supplementing your boas with any kind of vitamin supplementation. And that's even in the absence of UV light. I don't use any vitamin supplements. I don't use any full spectrum bulbs, anything like that. My boas are doing really well and they uh, will regularly pre-produce for me. Um, the question comes up, is supplementation bad or wrong? Um, I don't know the answer to this. There are times when maybe supplementation could be good. For example, a female boa right after giving birth, maybe certain types of supplements might help the female get back to breeding condition. Personally, I'd rather just feed the females a little bit extra, you know, a, a nice healthy rodent or bird, like a quail, uh, after they give birth, and that helps them get back up to uh, breeding condition. So while I can't say that supplementation is always bad or wrong, from my own experience it's really not necessary. And I remember back you know in the 80s and 90s when I was first getting into reptiles, the pet stores would push the reptile vitamins and they were rather expensive at the time, especially for a teenage kid. Um, but you know I don't use any vitamins like this. You know I, I thought for a while that vitamins weren't even around anymore, but apparently they've come back and a lot of people are kind of pushing you need, you need to use vitamins for your reptiles, but in my experience, it's completely unnecessary. As far as iodine and selenium, these are like trace elements and they're present in like minuscule quantities in the diet and that's all you need, either for a human or for a boa or you know another animal. You don't need a lot of these things and they're present in a lot of food. So I wouldn't even worry about these things like selenium and what was it, iodine. Um, you know, things like calcium, things like protein, of course, Maybe you can worry about that, but it's a little weird that these selenium and iodine, I'm not sure where the person heard that they should be supplementing their boa with these items. Okay, so the second question. Uh, why do you feed frozen thawed rodents? Boas need to hunt live prey in nature for their optimal health. Okay, so there are a number of reasons why I use frozen thawed rodents rather than using live rodents. And I will say that the only time I use live rodents is for baby boas that haven't started feeding on frozen thawed yet. And so the, one of the main reasons is because rodents can damage a snake. And I've seen these awful pictures of these poor boas and ball pythons, which have just been chewed to pieces by a rat because somebody left it in the cage with them overnight. And the rat basically ate the snake. The snake had to be euthanized, you know, in a totally preventable situation. So besides that, having live rodents is really inconvenient. They smell, they make noise, they escape. It's a lot more convenient for the reptile keeper to have the frozen variety, uh, just, you know, as far as handling the rodents. As far as whether it's more humane or not, you know, that's, that's questionable whether, you know, using CO2 or breaking their necks is more humane to a rodent than being constricted. You know, I'll leave that up to you. But the main reasons are just the convenience and the safety for the snake. As far as this whole argument about, well, it's natural for the snake to eat alive, you know, the whole invoking what's natural and invoking nature, in my opinion, is, is some of the weakest argument to support anything. 
there's a lot of natural things that are really, really bad. And if humans live naturally, our lifespan would be only about 30 years. We have no doctors or medicine or anything like that. If boas are raised naturally, 95% of them would die in the first year, just like in the wild. So obviously we don't want to do that. So when it comes to your boa, natural is not always the way to go. Okay, so question number three. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions on bioactive setups? So I've never actually done a bioactive setup. It seems to be all the rage lately. And it almost seems like people have this idea that somehow it's better than a more traditional, simple cage type of setup because it's natural. But you know, what did I just say about natural and you know, using that as a support for anything? Um, so while I'm not against bioactive setups and I think for smaller animals like frogs or maybe some small geckos, it might make more sense. With a, a boa is a relatively large snake. It makes a lot of poop and other wastes. So I guess you would need like little bugs to eat all the poop, you know, rather than the keeper just scooping out the poop. And I think that would be really, really tricky to get set up and working. Um, and honestly, I don't see the advantage because it's really not that hard, especially if you just have a few boas to clean out their cage thoroughly like once a week. Why would you need this bioactive setup? The boas don't care. You know, the, the boas aren't going to be living better because it's like nature. You know, as long as the boas have their, you know, the food they need, the right temperature and humidity, and the right shelter, they're going to be fine. So I wouldn't recommend doing a bioactive setup just because it's, you know, it's the all the rage or it's kind of a fad right now. If you really want to try it, go ahead. I'd love to hear your experience. You know, I'd like, hopefully at some point I might actually do a YouTube episode about bioactive setups. But like I said, I don't think it's really something that you should um, get into unless you specifically want to see if you can set up this bioactive setup. Your bar really doesn't need that. Okay, question number four. How do you make a living breeding snakes? I love this question. You know, please tell me because I don't make a living breeding snakes. In fact, you know, I make a little bit of money at this point after being going at it for quite a while, many, many years, and the money goes back into the hobby to feed my animals. Um, it's great that I have holdbacks that I can take to the next generation, um, and that's really why I do it. So I work a full-time job unrelated to the boas, and that allows me to have this hobby. And what I'll say is that very few people can make a full-time living doing nothing but breeding snakes. There have been a few people that have done this, and they're just kind of in the right place, the right time. Maybe they're in the right project. They get into a morph project that's really expensive and they can make a lot of money off of this. You know, or they, um, from a very early age, they're in the industry and they kind of work their way up. You know, there are several notable figures in the herp industry you know, that have been around for many, many decades and they've been able to do this. But for most of us, it's really not gonna be possible. And I really don't think you should aim for this because it's a lot easier to work a job doing something else. And then you can get money from that job and you can use it to support your boa hobby. You know, like I said, maybe at some point you can make a little bit of money coming in, which can keep your hobby going. Um, but for me, the main reason I do this, as I mentioned, is the holdbacks and getting these breeding projects down uh, to more generations, seeing where they go. And that's what really keeps me going. Okay, next question. Why don't you accept PayPal anymore? So as I announced recently, I no longer accept PayPal, and it's for a number of reasons. So the first is that there are a lot of really negative experiences that sellers have had with PayPal, and a lot of people advise me that I shouldn't do this anymore because eventually I'm gonna get burned. And what happens is that sometimes someone will buy a snake or other item, they'll have it shipped, you know, they'll receive the item, and then they'll tell PayPal that it never came or that you know they got ripped off. And PayPal always reverses the charges so that the seller loses the money. And it seems that the PayPal never takes into account you know, the story of the seller. So there's a lot of scams in, you know, in that regard. Also, people who buy stuff from PayPal have also gotten burned. Some reptile sellers will uh, insist that the buyer use the friends and family option, in which case that there's zero protection. And you know, a lot of times scammers will just keep the money and PayPal doesn't do anything. So the uh, one other issue is that the PayPal is not free 
and you know there's a relatively small percentage but this does add up over the course of many transactions and if I don't use PayPal it means that I don't have to charge as much for my animals in order to cover the PayPal fee. Um, another reason just has to do with the uh, idea of buying things on credit. Okay, PayPal, people buy stuff on a credit card. Personally, I think if someone is buying a BOA and they're making the commitment for a pet, they should have enough money to at least cover the cost of the animal up front. I mean, what do you do if the, your pet gets sick and you have to go to a vet and you don't have any money? So I, I don't take credit cards anymore because I think it, it encourages um, impulse purchases and people buying animals they maybe they shouldn't be buying. So if you can't come up with the full amount of money up front, you're not going to buy one of my animals. And it's the same reason why I don't do payment plans anymore. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is why I don't accept PayPal. Okay, so another question that came in is, you know, can you please invest in some better lighting so I can see the subtle colors of your boas? All right, so I actually, about a year ago, I bought this uh, video lighting kit, which included four uh, video lights with uh, 5500 Kelvin bulbs. So this is a daylight balanced, you know, color temperature to show accurate colors of the animals. And in fact, the person just asked this recently, um, after I had installed these, you know, the better lighting. If you go to my original videos, they look pretty bad. They're really dark. And I was just using lamps that I had lying around. Um, so, you know, I, I take pride that my videos have gotten better as far as the production. Obviously, you know, this is an IMAX. You're not going to get like a cinema experience because I'd much rather focus on the quality of the information rather than the quality of the video production. And I think it's adequate to get my ideas across. So the other thing I'll say is that if you really want to appreciate what boas look like as far as the colors, the only way to do this is to have the boa in person. So, you know, right now you're getting a pretty good look at this Venezuelan red tail. And, you know, part of the reason I set up this channel is to give people the experience of seeing all these boas and getting close to them. And I really think that my channel is probably the best you're going to get to experiencing these locality boas other than handling them yourselves. But again, you know, unless you have the boa in your hand, you're not going to appreciate, you know, the full experience of the boa and you're not going to appreciate some of the fine colors. And I can't really, you know, there's really not a better way that I can do this. You know, some of my close up videos, I try to show you the close ups of the colors and, you know, the animals are magnified quite a bit on screen. But, you know, really the uh, having the boa in the flesh, there's just no substitute for that. Okay, so the next question was about my recent episode I did on cocoa core bedding and how to use that in your reptile enclosures. And the question is, I currently use cypress mulch bedding as my substrate. Convince me that cocoa core is better. Okay, so if cypress mulch is working for you and you're fine with that, I would 100% recommend that you stay with that. So my videos are never meant to like convince somebody or to sell something. I'm just sharing experiences that I have. And although I'm using Coco Coir more than other substrates now, it's by no means perfect. And there are a number of drawbacks to the substrate. That being said, there are also a number of advantages. Um, the Cypress mulch, I've tried that a few times and it worked fine. In fact, it was fairly similar to the Coco Coir in a number of, of attributes. So I would say, you know, definitely if, if what you're working is working for you and you don't have any issues stay with that okay so don't just because I say something on my channel don't take it like you have to change um, ultimately you need to figure out for yourself what works best and then when you figure it out you just stick with it okay next question I gotta read it just so that I get it verbatim and the question was I need a Prometheus bloodline Suriname red tail boa for my future breeding plans and I messaged you numerous times over the last year expressing interest. But you had a litter and sold them all without contacting me. Why? Okay, I get emails constantly on you know, people wanting my animals. You know, pretty much every day I get several people that are interested in you know, one animal or another. I can't keep track of all this. It's just a little bit too much. Um, I wish I could clone these animals. I wish, you know, breeding them and getting hundreds and hundreds or maybe thousands of them was real simple, but it's not. And I, you know, produce a small number of these animals. 
I try to keep it as fair as possible as far as you know distributing my animals. I don't do waiting lists. Um, it's first come first serve. I make these videos announcing when I'm going to have the animals up for sale. Um, it's just not possible for everybody to get these animals who wants them. That's just you know the way it is. So you know if you pay attention to my videos and um, if you if you contact me ahead of time, I can you know advise you on when they might be available. But there's no way I could reach out to everybody that expressed an interest in my animals when they're available. I, I would do nothing else with my entire life other than be contacting people. Um, so you know if you want to get some of my animals, watch my videos. You know keep in touch. Follow me on you know Facebook and YouTube and the other social media. But I can't reach out to people. It's just too much bandwidth for me to do, um, you know, in order to reach out to everybody that's interested in my animals when they're available. Okay. Uh, next question. Do boas recognize individual human owners? Okay, so when I first got this question, I thought, well, no, they don't. And, you know, some maybe people like to believe that their boa recognizes them and they can tell the difference between them and somebody else. Um, but then, you know, I, thought, I kind of thought about it a little bit. And yes, I would say that although boas may not recognize individual people, they do recognize individual behavior patterns. And some people certainly have a more effective way of interacting with boas and handling them than others. And you may have heard the cliche, you know, animals can sense fear. And it's really true. Boas can pick up on people who are nervous or they don't feel comfortable picking up the boa. And the boa is a lot more likely to act aggressively or to try to escape or to try to, you know, bite the person. Um, other people, they just know how to hold the boa. They know they, how to, they have the confidence that, you know, inspires the boa to be a little bit calmer and more handleable. You know, just from handling these animals year after year in many cases. And so your boa will recognize individual handling. And, you know, hopefully you have interacted the most with your pet boa. So you know most about how to handle him or her and, you know, what is most effective. So in that regard, I would say, yes, that boas do recognize individual people. But they're not going to know your name or probably they're not going to recognize your face or anything like that. Okay, so the last question in today's episode, I get questions a lot about Doomerals boas. You know, people ask me, what are your thoughts about Doomerals boas? Are Doomerals boas good pets? Why don't you have any Doomerals boas? And so I'll first say, uh, first off, I've never had a Doomerals boa. I've come pretty close to buying them many years ago. They really look cool, beautiful animals. They're supposedly great to handle, make great pets. They've gotten like super popular the last few years. I remember for a long time, you could pick one up for like a hundred bucks. And you know, people just didn't like them, but I think there have been some Facebook or YouTube videos about them. And you know, certain YouTubers have really pumped them up. And now everybody wants these Doomerals boas. Um, so I don't have a Doomerals boa because I've got so many other boas. You know, it'd be like asking somebody, why don't you have any Crawl Key boas, or Tar Humara boas, or Venezuelan Red Tail boas, or Sao Paulo Bolivian boas, or Brazilian boas. I mean, there's only so many boas one person can handle, and I'm pretty much at my maximum as far as the bandwidth to care and house for all these animals. Um, I wouldn't, you know, based on my what I know about Doomerals boas, I, you know, they seem like a cool animal, you know, which I would recommend. I can't, you know, explicitly do this because I've never kept one and I don't really recommend things that I haven't, you know, I used myself and, but, but, you know, they do look like great animals. Um, so if you want one, you know, go for it. Let, let it, let me know how it goes. You know, maybe at some point in the future, I'll pick one up. And I know that they have some dwarf Doomerals boas. My, my friend uh, Michael Beach is breeding and they look really, really cool. They only get like four feet long. Um, so definitely a cool project if you want a small type of a Doomerals boa. Okay, so those were your questions. Uh, as I mentioned, I like getting these questions, so keep them coming. And I'll try to do videos like this in the future. Hopefully this was helpful to you and some of this knowledge might come in handy someday. Uh, as always, shoot me any more questions you might have. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.